Hi, everybody. My name is Selena Zhang, and I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships at the Canadian Urban Institute. And I'd like to welcome everybody today to this mobilization session for the Healthy Communities Initiative. Today's session is all about simple ways to create vibrant, safe spaces or adapt public places and programming during a pandemic. I am really pleased to be joined today by my colleagues at Park People and um, we're also really grateful to our partner um, who's leading the charge here, the Community Foundations of Canada, as well as our other program partners, 880 Cities, the Canadian Community Economic Development Network, ICLE Canada, MARS, the National Association of Friendship Centers, B. Ronville, um, J. Petter Placemaking, and the Network for the Advancement of Black Communities. Today, I'm calling in from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Anishinaabeg nations. And um, through the lens of acknowledging the Indigenous peoples whose lands we are on, and shifting towards action around how that applies to public space, what, which we're talking about today, who has access to public space, who feels included on public space, the kinds of activity that take place and for whom the responsibilities that we have to the land and to each other and layered with the pandemic on top of that. Um, we are mindful of the histories of broken treaties and we're mindful of the historical and current day atrocities that continue to impact the lives of Indigenous people, including um, but not limited to um, the news that's been unfolding in the last few days about the, the tragedy and violence experienced by many, many, many children in the residential school system. I, as a member of the CUI team, am mindful about all of our responsibilities to work towards reconciliation, not just as placemakers, city builders, practitioners, policymakers, but as community members and as settlers old and new and residents on this land. I would invite you here, as some people are already doing, to tell us about where you're calling in from. I know there are lots of people here from all across the country, so welcome. And if you wish, if you know um, uh, the Indigenous land that you're on, feel free to make a land acknowledgement as well. And as you do that, just switch the toggle on your chat box to all panelists and attendees, rather than just all panelists, because then everybody in the room can see your comments and see where you're dialing in from. Um, throughout today's conversation, do feel free to make use of the chat box. That's kind of one of the benefits of being in the Zoom world as we are now and for the last year is that so often what we see is, you know, this, this great presentation happening in the broadcast and this whole parallel universe of conversation and happening between attendees um, and attendees and speakers um, in the chat room. And so feel free to make the best use of that. And we also have staff that are dedicated to manning the chat. So if you have questions about the Healthy Communities Initiative or about the program, you can pop them in there and somebody on the staff side will make sure to answer those questions. If your question is about your specific application or project, there's a chance that we won't have that direct question or answer ready for you. But certainly um, what we can do is share the email of the Healthy Communities Initiative Help Desk that you can reach out to to discuss the specific details of your project with somebody. Other things you should be aware of, this session is available in both English and French. Um, to access the French interpretation, just go to the little globe at the bottom of your screen. Um, the session is also being recorded and it will be available on the Healthy Communities Initiative website in the days to come. And for those that are new to the program, the Healthy Communities Initiative is a $31 million investment from the Government of Canada to support local efforts to adapt public spaces during COVID-19. Funding is available between $5,000 and $250,000, and the second round of granting closes on June 25th at 5 p.m., so um, a little less than a month to get your application ready. Uh, the first round of this program was highly competitive. In the first round, we received over 3,000 requests, totaling more than $360 million. 
we've already granted to over 250 initiatives and a map of all of those initiatives is available on the Healthy Communities Initiative website and make sure you are checking that out there. Um, and so really that's it for me in terms of housekeeping things. Let's get on to the show. Um, I'm so pleased to pass it on to my colleagues at Park People who are gonna take it from here. So Rachel, over to you. Thank you so much, Selena. Uh, I'm just going to put up my presentation here uh, and uh, I'll introduce myself first off. Um, bonjour and bienvenue. Um, hello and welcome to everyone and, and thanks for, for hosting us here. Thanks to CFC and CUI and all the technical partners on this project. Um, my name is Rachel Leanne Shishin. Uh, I'm a senior project manager with Park People. Uh, I too am in uh, the uh, traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Um, Toronto is also home to many other diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Important to note that the territory is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and that we are all treaty people. Uh, and my thoughts today are with, with survivors and, and those um, intergenerationally affected by survivors. So thank you for having me here today. So today we are in this community mobilization session of the Healthy Communities Initiative to, um, to talk about simple ideas around um, actions that communities are taking to adapt public places to create vibrant and safe accessible spaces. So we're gonna be sharing some inspiring ideas uh, around adapting programming in community parks and other spaces. Um, we're hoping to inspire, mobilize, and invite you to participate in this program. As, as Selena mentioned, specific questions you have around the funding and, and how to apply can be directed to CFC, and they're really awesome at helping out in the chat and answering questions. Um, so today, uh, Park People's here to talk about some uh, great projects for inspiration, um, and uh, particularly to inspire um, and mobilize grassroots community groups who might never have applied for this type of funding before and to really encourage equity-based placemaking in community, communities that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Um, and we're also going to, Park People will be putting together a blog of um, the links and the ideas we share in the session today that will be available on our website. And as Selena mentioned, the chat window is a great place to share your ideas. Happy to continue that conversation and that collaborative spirit and, and share with us about your cool projects that you're excited about across the country. So I'll introduce uh, my colleagues as well who are going to be speaking today. Um, Sue Arndt uh, is program manager and Mash Saleh Homum is Vancouver project manager. So you'll also be hearing from them today. Um, and a quick introduction for those of you who are meeting uh, us for the first time. Park People helps activate the power of parks to improve quality of life in cities across Canada. Uh, our national network provides comprehensive support to grassroots community groups, nonprofit organizations, and municipal staff across the country who are working to animate and enhance their local parks. Our programs aim to provide communities with the tools and inspiration they need to animate and improve their city parks. We facilitate information exchange and peer learning between Canadians, as well as bringing innovative city park ideas and projects to life through new partnership and research. This year, we're excited to be celebrating our 10th anniversary of activating the power of parks. We have offices uh, and staff on the ground in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. And we have numerous ways that we work alongside communities. We have a network of over 900 grassroots community park groups working in over 40 cities across the country. Uh, we have a national micro granting program across nine urban centers and many other exciting opportunities. So I encourage you to check us out. My, my colleagues sharing some links in the chat. Uh, another note is we have resources online where they're um, hands-on guides to planning activities and events um, for animating parks and public spaces. So we also have resources on organizational planning. We have some really interesting case studies and research papers. Uh, we do an annual report on uh, Canadian city parks, which is coming out uh, in about a month. So lots of exciting things to, to share there. Um, and for the Healthy Communities Initiative funding, it is very important that your projects show how you're planning for meaningful community engagement. So Park People has lots of resources and tips on that. 
Um, we have a few things to share today um, to, to, for you to demonstrate. It's really important to demonstrate meaningful community engagement, including with the communities, with and by the communities who are disproportionately affected by COVID-19, including equity-seeking communities. So um, you want to look at how there's going to be local leadership in decision making and project delivery and how you're going to engage and generate participation in your project. So a few resources we thought of that would be helpful to share specific to these ideas. One is um, insights from a webinar discussion that we held last year on reimagining public engagement in parks and public spaces. Um, so we're sharing that resource with some really uh, great insights on public engagement. And also um, we have a resource about community partnerships and some, some key elements to making community partnerships so we'll, we'll be popping those in the chat window. And then also just ways to keep in touch with us if you're inspired or interested in the work we're doing. We have a monthly newsletter uh, where you can hear about opportunities, resources, and events that keep you connected to parks and public space issues that you care about. Uh, we have a fully national bilingual French and English Facebook group. Uh, and uh, you can see us on the regular social media channels. And now I'm going to pass over to my, Sue, uh, my colleague, Sue. <laughs> oh, you just have to take your mic. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, I just want to start out talking about public space. Um, it's become even more apparent this year that great animated parks and public spaces are so important and provide multiple benefits, including positive impacts on environment, economy, physical and mental health, and social connectedness among community members. Last year, Park People surveyed the general public and municipalities on the impact of COVID-19 on city parks in Canada. Through this survey, we learned that parks have played a vital role in people's lives during the pandemic, with the majority of Canadians saying that parks have become more important to both their mental and physical health during COVID. Municipalities are also appreciating the value of parks more than ever. 94% of cities surveyed said that amongst municipal leadership, they've seen increased recognition of the value of parks, both to public health and crisis resiliency. Despite parks or park amenities being closed during COVID, of all the cities we surveyed, over half of the cities reported that they've seen increased park use during the pandemic. And two thirds of Canadians said that they've been visiting parks several times a week or more on average. But despite the increased usage and importance, uh, um, municipal park budgets are facing insecurity. 57% of the cities surveyed said that COVID-19 is likely to have a negative impact on park budgets within the next year. So that's one of the reasons why partnerships and community programs like the Healthy Communities Initiative can add much value to public spaces um, and add value to core city services. The intent, um, the intent is not to replace the work of the cities, but in fact, to make more impactful programming in public spaces um, through innovative partnerships. So projects funded by the initiative must be in the local community's public interest um, by operating in public space and for public benefit. So projects in public space take place in any space owned or operated by a municipality, the provincial or federal government, um, non-commercial organizations such as nonprofits and educational institutions or indigenous communities and First Nation reserves. And looking at public spaces, really looking at the focus on projects also serving specific communities that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, such as areas of a city where um, there isn't as much access to green space or parks. Um, so some simple examples are towns, city parks, sidewalks, streets and rec centers, and these would all be considered public space in the HCI initiative. So, it's also really interesting to think of public lands that aren't parks. And I thought I'd just point out a few examples before we get into some real project examples. Um, and one of these examples is electricity corridors. So thousands of square kilometers of electricity corridors run through communities 
and can be great for projects. Uh, the Meadowway in Toronto is a great example. It's a 16 kilometer long linear park that's been transitioned into a pollinator uh, meadow and is used for many different community events. Another um, great example of a creative use of space is to partner with community housing lands. Many of these communities are disproportionately impacted by COVID as they often have less access to public space and backyards. And there could be exciting, impactful projects on these lands, as well as active community members really ready to get engaged. Schools and universities are also really great examples of, of public spaces that could benefit from projects. Um, and these projects could take place in schoolyards or colleges and university lands. So the key point here is to really be creative. Um, maybe COVID has shown that your community lacks sufficient green space. They are underutilized and neglected public spaces that could be turned into dynamic community spaces that support community response to COVID. And it can sometimes be easier to get permission in these more creative spaces than in informalized city parks to do work. Um, and this example in the photo here is Flyover Park in Calgary is a really um, exciting example of innovative use of space. And MASH is gonna touch on that as a, a project example a little later in the presentation. So just a last note on private or public spaces is that uh, projects on public or on private lands are not eligible for funding through this initiative, including um, faith based groups, privately owned public spaces, businesses and um, privately owned apartment buildings. So the next part of the presentation is that we're going to take you um, through a range of projects from across Canada's um, that could provide some innovative ideas and inspiration on what you could maybe do in your community or as part of your project. It's important when planning your project um, and seeking funding from the Healthy Communities Initiative to review all the details of your project and to ensure that it is eligible. But all of these projects we're going to discuss are the types of projects um, HCI would fund. Um, and this is not designed to be a detailed step-by-step, -step, um, but a high-level inspiration um, to uh, inspire you in your project planning. So we are going to go quickly through a few examples. And as Rachel mentioned, we will share a blog post afterwards with links to all of the projects if you're interested in learning more about the organizations and how they're engaging their communities. Um, Park People has been involved in all of these projects in some way. And I did just wanna note that many of these pictures were taken pre-COVID. So there will be uh, photos of people gathering um, without masks and in larger groups. Um, this project that's up uh, right now on the screen is the Red Embers project in Allen Gardens in Toronto. Uh, it's a great example of a partnership between local indigenous organizations, artists, and a community park group. Uh, with this project, 15 female identifying artists created an exhibit that represents an expression of inclusion, resiliency, healing, and self-determination. Um, it honors the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls with a 13 large-scale banners. Um, and an Indigenous healing garden is also part of the project within the park. So projects like this are a really great fit for the program. They're supporting efforts focused on inclusion and communities disproportionately impacted by COVID, bringing that community together in a safe way um, and building links between different uh, members of the community. The next example is the Flemington Community Farm or Flemmo Farm. It's a 1.5 acre community food garden in a hydro corridor in an underserved neighborhood in Toronto. It is a community owned and community developed initiative developed through a partnership between a food security organization and local public health center. So half the farm is cared for by staff who will grow and harvest food with the help of residents through a volunteer program. And the other half is dedicated to plots for local growers who run small farm businesses through the community farmer program. So this is obviously based around food security, um, which has been highlighted as an increasing challenge during COVID and is a really great focus for um, ensuring that uh, our communities are responding to 
challenges during COVID. So um, Maybell Arts is the next example we'll be looking at. Um, Maybell um, Arts began this Maybell Pantry program as a COVID emergency response to food insecurity for the residents on Maybell Avenue in Etobicoke. Uh, this is a high density community that has been disproportionately affected by COVID. There are largely low income families, seniors, new immigrants, refugees and asylum seekers that make up the population, many of whom had relied on food banks uh, that closed when the pandemic hit. So the nearest grocery store in this community is a 20 minute uh, bus ride away. And this pantry project started to welcome residents with an artful, fun, friendly, and COVID safe pantry experience that it's reminiscent of an outdoor farmer's market. Um, the weekly event is designed to provide reprieve from isolation in a safe way for the community members, but also providing regular contact with their most vulnerable community members and increasing access to food. The next example, uh, Wex Pops, is a project where community partners created temporary gathering space with seating in native gardens in a parking lot um, in an underserved community in Toronto with music and programming um, and gathering space. Uh, it's organized by a local nonprofit and supported by local businesses to facilitate community connection and engagement. Projects like this would be a really great fit for the program with um, businesses very challenged from COVID. So engaging in, with the business community and the community here also lacked um, gathering places and green space. So this type of project can um, work to help bring the community together as well. Um, I do wanna know, it, and this project in particular did occur on a business parking lot, which is a privately owned parking lot but the methods and um, the model could be applied to eligible spaces through this project. And um, another great example is the Milky Way Indigenous Initiative by Greenest City. It's a project that's led by a local nonprofit who primarily work in an underserved community uh, in Toronto and in partnership with Indigenous leaders their project aims to provide a way forward, centering discussions of urban land stewardship around truth and reconciliation. It has the unique position of taking place on Toronto's first community owned land held by the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. Um, and act activities here are focused around access for indigenous centered inter intergenerational knowledge sharing, land stewardship practices, traditions and ceremonies and sustainable food systems learning. Um, they're currently offering a range of programming, both in small groups in person when it's safe to do so, and over the last year have been doing quite a bit um, of programming remotely and virtually um, due to COVID. So really some uh, great innovative pivots there to bring their teachings and their engagement online. So I'm going to pass it over to Rachel to share a few more examples. Thanks, Sue. So we're, we're doing a little bit of a journey across uh, around, around the country in no particular order. I'm going to talk about a few different examples uh, in Montreal and the East Coast. So um, I've spoken about this one uh, before. So apologies for the repetition if any of you are joining our webinars for the second or third time. But there's a beautiful example that we love to talk about, uh, ephemeral forest in Montreal, <laughs> Parc Jarry. Uh, so it was an initiative of the Cap Jarry or the coalition of Friends of Jerry Park. So it was a temporary pop-up installation of recycled Christmas trees where neighbors were invited to bring their trees to the park after the holidays were over and the trees were set up as a, as a temporary forest. So visitors could attach decorations and wishes for the park uh, or in general uh, to the trees. And the forest created a sense of human connection at a time when people needed it most. Uh, it was magical to walk through the hundreds of trees in the middle of this vast park uh, and a, a joyful experience and, and addressed a real need, particularly during winter of having park programming when confinement is most amplified. Um, so there were some uh, real working together in the community here. Uh, and another key element was it was uh, a, a small scale event, an idea that could be easily transferable from one space to another or from one city to another. 
Um, it's a lot of potential for, for vacant lots or small parks and doesn't require a lot of resources up front, but can have a real impact. Um, the second one is um, from a group called Senga Quebec, which is a citizen movement to which has a goal of creating links between those new to Quebec, including refugees and newcomers uh, with the folks living there. So the, their initiative was um, called uh, Deconfining Hope, A Walk Through Our Lives, which was a traveling photo exhibition um, presented in collaboration with some funding from part people. Uh, the community project helped ease the isolation of the pandemic during the coldest month of the year, another winter example, um, by facilitating intercultural exchange and the rediscovery of parks. So the photos were posted um, in, in, a, in a park with, and they told the story of um, different journeys uh, from people's country of origin uh, into Montreal. So there were testimonies written and shared in various languages, French, Arabic, Turkish, Spanish, and English. Um, so it was a great way to bring, bring different people in the community together. Uh, this example is from Quebec City. Uh, it's an edible forest, a, a green infrastructure, infrastructure project in Quebec City. Um, so it consists of creating a nourishing ecosystem that's in harmony with nature, but also improves food security and access for local residents, residences. Um, and so it's a place where there's a real collective experience um, where people are contributing to the development of their community and accessing local healthy and free food as well as the support network. So the project was brought to life um, by a nonprofit called Agiro and a collaboration with a, a local residence group um, where they, they planted all kinds of different um, fruit trees and as well as some deciduous and coniferous trees. Um, and so the, the forest garden is located on a large piece of land bordering Lac saint Charles, um, and uh, which the city had acquired um, and has been uh, preserved as green space. Um, and Lac saint Charles is also in another important space that supplies drinking water to a large part of the population in Quebec. So uh, the, the, the forest serves a lot of uh, positive um, a lot of positive uh, outcomes to um, maintain the health of the lake and also kind of provide this natural food pantry for local residents. Another example in Montreal is uh, Le Carré Saruel or the square and its alley in Montreal's Rose borough of Rosemont La Petite Patrie. So um, the citizens behind this initiative uh, have been mobilizing since 2016 around a greening project of the Saint-Dominique-Cascrain Green Lane. Um, and so during its first year, several residents adopted flower beds and animated the alley in one way or another um, and, and kind of reappropriated the land uh, in, in this area, uh, kind of on a grassroots level. And so it's been, there's lots of, been lots of creativity um, demonstrated by this project uh, and since the start of the pandemic, it's really continued to inspire resilience in the community. So last June, for example, they found themselves with their tools and their hands in the dirt during a bin building and planting event. Um, so it was also in addition to maintaining the link between the, the public square and the alleyway, uh, the members also encouraged people to take time to observe the, the natural spaces around them and the living environment where they, where they all lived. Um, and uh, they also hosted another event last year, which was a botanical painting workshop where they were able to gather safely uh, and easily adapted to, to COVID um, restrictions, but also brought some great joy to the community. And then over to um, Halifax, we'd like to talk about this example in um, Dartmouth, the Park Avenue Community Bake Oven, which uh, was um, founded uh, in 2012 by citizens and operated by, volunteer, by volunteers. Um, the uh, Community Bake Oven has a long history of bringing people together by creating a sense of place around food. So there's a, there's a community bake oven as well as a garden and some orchards. Uh, and uh, we noticed the total volunteer work of this group was over 300 hours last year. So by attracting uh, people, the oven promotes um, 
exchanges of recipes and food sharing amongst neighbors, um, which really brings people together and um, lots of activities uh, on an ongoing basis. So really, um, and it, it, we, we had a really lovely story that it was a, um, it warmed the community after Hurricane Dorian. It really brought people together. Oh, sorry. Um, so just another great example of some inspiring um, projects that can happen in your communities. So I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, Bash. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Nash Salomum, and I'm joining from the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, or so-called Vancouver. I'm just going to take a few more minutes to talk about a couple more creative placemaking projects from the West Coast. Uh, this here on the screen is a really wonderful group called Hives for Humanity, who works with volunteers in Vancouver's downtown east side to create and maintain pollinator gardens and hives. This is a really wonderful group. Um, beekeeping is surprisingly very therapeutic and the pollinator gardens also create great habitat connections for the city's native pollinator species. Plus they get um, honey and candles out of the process, which Hives for Humanity then sells through local businesses to support their ongoing efforts. The downtown east side has a very vulnerable population who is disproportionately affected by COVID. And while this work is always really important, um, during COVID it's been especially so as it helps the participants develop and maintain a sense of place and connection with land, their communities, and also with nature in an otherwise very urban environment, um, supporting both mental and physical health during this exceptionally difficult time. And this is a really wonderful project because both um, the, the participants have also taught the beekeepers who are professional beekeepers a lot about this project. Um, so we've seen a lot of organizations move their programs to virtual platforms and in the process find um, new ways to um, create much needed community connections during this time, even reaching new audiences that may have not been able to participate in their programming before. Uh, Still Moon Art Society, for example, always holds so many wonderful events that bring together nature, education, community, and art um, around the beautiful urban Renfrew Ravine. So early on into COVID, they had this virtual bird watching workshop for the Dawn Chorus. Sarah Ross, also known as Red Sarah, is an environmental educator, and she gave a talk um, online to the community about birds and their communication styles. The morning following the talk, they asked the community to get up at the crack of dawn in the summertime, so pretty early, and um, they asked everyone to go to a local green space and record the sounds of the birds in the morning, uh, also called the dawn chorus. And then everyone sent in their bird calls and Still Moon edited them all together and shared the final product on a digital platform. So you could hear the birds um, from the same time of day all over the city, which created this really magical connection in the community while motivating everyone to go outside and be in nature, um, despite having to connect online. In Calgary, this park was born out of a vision developed by a group of residents who wanted to reclaim an underutilized space. So this space was originally a field of gravel under an overpass, um, giving it its name Flyover Park. Initially engaged residents implemented small placemaking interventions, also called tactile urbanism, that allowed them to test out ideas for the space while engaging with more of the community and building partnerships with folks who would eventually be involved in the larger and um, eventually permanent project plan. So some of the small interventions included a windmill garden, community murals painted on the roads, and beautifying the fences and picnic benches in the area. And then these all helped catch the attention of a huge variety of future partners and the city. So the local schools grade six students and students from the University of Calgary School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape uh, collaborated to design the park and eventually successfully transformed this empty space into a vibrant community hub where more people have been able to get out safely and reap the benefits of parks and public spaces. So we know that these spaces are so important for communities and with 62% of residents in the neighborhood living in apartments, this was an especially important place during the pandemic. This park helped fill the gap for those who did not have safe outdoor um, space to play and connect with one another um, during COVID and also this park. Um, so it is able to serve as sort of that living room that we all used our parks for. 
Um, also, this park plays a vital role in connecting the neighborhood's parks, community gardens, sports fields, and bike lanes to Calgary's Bow River Pathway System, which is a 48-kilometer-long network of trails that many citizens um, in the community use to walk or cycle to work and get to wherever else they need to go. Plus, um, it has an undercover area, which makes it a great spot on rainy days to get outside. Um, roller skating continues to make a comeback during the pandemic. The East Van Skate Crows is a group of young women and gender non-conforming folks who all found each other as they were looking for new ways to stay active while following the COVID health guidelines. So seeing that most of the skate parks were designed for and dominated by experienced white male skateboarders, um, which many of the newbies found a little intimidating, um, they created this group and encouraged other beginners to get involved as well through their skate camp initiatives, which um, aim to make skating more approachable. And they encourage members to check out new parks across the city and become stewards of these skate parks and their surrounding spaces through this initiative. They even supplied materials and taught their members how to create their own customized portable skate rails so that they could continue practicing and developing their skills from any public space that they felt comfortable in, um, especially on rainy days, um, they could go into covered outdoor spaces as well. So most of these skaters were all brand new and had never tried skating before. And now they have over 60 members all learning how to build community safely and recreate outdoors and move around the city in this new fun way. Um, this group really highlighted the need for more undercover outdoor spaces, though, to practice this alternative transport option um, safely in uh, Vancouver's very rainy climate. And then um, also for the creation of separate spaces for beginners using any kind of wheel, whether it be skateboard or roller skating. Uh, one more. So this one is from Calgary. Springboard Performance put on a really neat event called Contain R. This was a youth mural project that was adapted to meet COVID health guidelines. So youth project teams painted murals on shipping containers to serve as outdoor public art performances and installations. This was a really neat project as it helped address the demand and need for having um, increased opportunities for youth in the community to socialize with one another during this time and provide meaningful contributions to the neighborhood using art and self-expression. They've been hosting this event for a number of years now, but usually as one big festival over a single weekend. But um, last year for COVID, they added a bunch more days to ensure that the whole community could participate safely. So there are a bunch of other projects and initiatives that I wish I could highlight, but I know that we wanna save some time for questions. So I'll end the Park People part of the presentation here, but if you'd like to know more, please head over to our website to join the network and check out all of our resources. and. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with us for anything park related. Um, but for now, I'll pass it over to Rapal to um, lead the question and answer part of this presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rupal. I work at Canadian Urban Institute, and I'm here to facilitate a quick Q&A between the folks on the call uh, and some of the folks from Park People. Thank you very much. And Michelle from Community, Community Foundations of Canada, who's just joining us now. So, Michelle, I'll let you get settled in. Um, thank you for joining us. I've got a couple of questions here that I think might be relevant to folks on the call. Um, the first one, especially because we are talking about public space, um, are permits required to apply to this program? Thanks, Rupal. Uh, hi, everybody. Nice to be here today. Uh, it's just started raining here in Ottawa, and it's so exciting. It's been, it's been weeks and weeks, so I'm thrilled to see the rain, although I heard that Vancouver is very rainy. <laughs> I'm thrilled to have it here. Um, so in terms of permits, um, we, you are not required to have a permit when you're writing your application. However, it's strongly advised that, that you know what you will need if you are approved. So we would suggest that you've done your research, you reach out to your local municipalities, find out what you'll need, maybe get it started, and you should be able to demonstrate that in the application itself. Thank you. Um, there have also been a couple of questions in the chat about timing, um, how long people have to spend their HCI funding if they get it, and also how far back um, you can retroactively include expenses. Can you give a sense of what the time frame is? 
Yeah, absolutely. So ultimately, the project activities that are funded through the Healthy Communities Initiative uh, need to be spent um, on June 30th, 2022. So before, before that date, um, activities could continue in the same program. However, um, the ones that, that the initiative is funding, those would need to be complete by that time. Um, and they are available retroactively. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up the date because I want to make sure I get it right. Um, I believe it's April, April 1st, 2020, but I'm going to double check that to make sure I've got the date right. <laughs> Thank you. And folks can always go into the guide. It's very, very detailed. Like we're very privileged to have Michelle with us here, but the guide is very, very detailed. So if there's anything else that you want to know, make sure you take a look. Uh, Michelle, I'll take you off of the hot seat just for a moment because we have a really good question that came in um, through the chat that maybe Rachel, Sue, or Mash might want to um, address, maybe all of you. It's from Mike, and he says he's having a hard time understanding the distinction between kind of pre and post COVID benefits. And he wants to know if, if somebody could elaborate on some of the specific problems that COVID has presented and give examples of some steps that organizations or communities might be taking to specifically address COVID-related issues uh, in their community. Who wants to um, jump I can in? take a first go at it, and then if Rachel or Mash have anything to add, that would be Great. Um, I think it's really important to identify, yeah, that pre and post COVID issues, you know, they have been, COVID's shone a light on a lot of systemic issues that already existed in our public spaces and in our communities. And I think it's deepened a lot of those issues, but a lot of the examples of what we have shown today are projects that, you know, obviously have been running pre-COVID and some are responses directly to COVID um, and some required pivoting. So I think um, COVID really highlighted issues around access to green space, equitable access to green space across communities, especially in highly urban areas. So where people may not have backyards to sit in and they might not have close proximity to parks and natural areas. It's really shone a light on issues around food security and access to healthy foods and how people, especially with potential like mobility issues or um, other issues that, you know, how do they access food in their communities and um, as well as issues around social isolation and community connection. And, and I think those are all issues that existed pre-COVID, but COVID's really deepened those and shone a light on how much work we all have to do to um, create these community spaces that respond to those challenges. And so I understand it's hard to uh, uh, provide that kind of distinction between pre and post COVID because a lot of it is really around designing your projects maybe with one or all of those things in mind. And I think social isolation, especially when we're talking about community um, healthy community initiatives. I think the social isolation and identifying opportunities to use public spaces to respond to that is incredibly important. And all of the projects we've shown really did that before and after COVID. So, um, and I know gathering, you know, we all have different um, rules right now from public health in the different communities we're in across Canada. And, and we're all hopeful that those will continue to um, change and open up a little bit more in our communities. But I, I think a lot of the groups that we work with and we've heard from are also pivoting a lot of things to online. And, and you know, that might still present some challenges for, you know, people in the communities that might not have access to the technology or, or um, seniors that might not be as tech savvy as, as other parts of our community. And so I think really the key thing is knowing understanding those barriers and talking to your participants, whether it's online or in small groups or in person or um, via phone to really understand what people's barriers are to engaging and, and how that we can innovate within our own programs or within our own projects to try to reduce those barriers. And I think we're gonna learn so much through the light that's been shone during COVID on what these challenges are and be able to, when we are post COVID, hopefully, 
you know, sooner than later at some point, um, be able to still keep applying what, what we've learned during COVID to our projects to make them really um, meet the needs of our communities and understand that, you know, some community members are being disproportionately affected by some of these issues and really trying to um, relate our learnings to um, increase engagement from to those folks. So I hope that answers the question. I don't know if Rachel or Mash, you have anything to add. I think you covered it all. Thanks, Sue. I've got a related question uh, that I think has also come through the chat, which are, what are some of the unexpected barriers and gaps that you might have heard about that communities have had to overcome during the pandemic in order to execute or run some of these COVID responsive, COVID responsive projects? So maybe some unanticipated challenges or gaps that had to be dealt with on the fly that you can lay out for a couple of folks so they can avoid those pitfalls? Yeah, I think, I mean, one thing that comes to mind, and I'm not sure if this is as, you know, a biggest surprise, I think we've all probably experienced it to a certain extent, is that when you're thinking about pivoting maybe your project or your community engagement to online, just understanding that all of us are, you know, whether it's our work or our, you know, kids' school or, projects that we're engaged with, everything's pivoting to online. So there's a lot of fatigue, I think, and a lot of kind of disengagement or, or kind of um, maybe people just sort of stepping away from really wanting to stay engaged until we can be back in person again. So I think that is a, a challenge to overcome through thinking through maybe some creative ways beyond um, beyond Zoom, I know we're all on Zoom right now, <laughs> beyond like, and in, in how to um, engage. And, and Rachel, maybe you can speak a little bit to not to put you on the spot, but um, the forest bathing session that you just participated in and, and a few, like we've seen a lot of really creative solutions to inviting people to um, connect through technology, but in spaces that might, you know, really inspire kind of creativity and, and engagement. Yeah, I, I um, definitely echo that uh, that creative piece, which you know sometimes when there's so many other heavy things laying on or responsibilities, it's difficult to conjure that up. But it's still, I feel like it's still we have the the capability to to do this to work together. And um, the event that you're talking about, I spoke about this in our last mobilization session about this idea of the the asynchronous type of event or initiative where it doesn't involve one single gathering of a whole bunch of people because right now with COVID restrictions and possibly for a little while into the future, we won't be able to gather together in one large group at one time, but that doesn't mean that we still can't um, facilitate connections between each other as people. And um, so we can have types of events where um, it's over a longer period of time where People are visiting one same site at, at different times and not all in one group. Um, the uh, forest bathing um, workshop that uh, was run a couple of weeks ago uh, was a uh, was a, a Zoom call, but it was um, participants were encouraged to um, call in on their phones and have one earbud listening to the the session and the other one. Uh, listening to their surroundings and the, the birds and the trees and the, the other sounds um, and sort of experience uh, experience nature that way. So it was just another like lovely, lovely way of, um, of just sort of uh, continuing to think about things differently um, and, uh, and, and continue to explore possibilities. Thank you. Yeah. So Michelle, back to you just for a second. Um, there's been some curiosity in the chat, obviously, around which projects were funded in round one. Um, is there any way you could give us an example of a project that was uh, funded in round one that aligns with this theme of creating safe and vibrant spaces, just to give people a sense of, uh, of what was funded? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... There was one project that was just actually uh, announced, uh, I think it was last 
last week um, called the Rideau Winter Trail Sustainability and Expansion Project, and that was here in Ottawa. And so the project uh, will animate parkland previously underutilized in the winter to create a safe and vibrant space along the Rideau River for people of all ages so that they can walk, cross country ski, snowshoe, and fat bike. Um, and so the Rideau Winter Trail Group is volunteer run and it operates for free on very terrain and it's a nine kilometer urban trail that otherwise wouldn't be accessible in the winter for those activities. Thank you. Just checking to see if there are any last minute questions coming in through the chat. It doesn't look like there are. So thank you everyone for joining us today. I know that the Q&A is always a bit of a whirlwind, but I really appreciate appreciate having folks to, um, to answer questions in real time. So thank you. Um, thanks to our colleagues at Park People for joining us today. Thanks to Michelle. And um, we're just about to throw up a quick poll. Um, if you could please fill it out, that would be great. And while you're doing that, I want to remind you that our next community mobilization session is coming up next week on June 8th. It's hosted by uh, one of our partners, Ickley Canada, and the topic is how to write a funding application, Tate tips for first time applicants, which I know will be of interest to many folks on the call. Uh, tell your friends, share the link, and we will see you back here on June 8th. Thanks so much. <laughs>